Hello class, this is Deshonda Stanton with NUR 170 and I am coming to you live to go over hypertension, CHF, and coronary artery disease. First, let's start with um, coronary artery disease. Um, some of the things that you need to think about with coronary artery disease is that this is in relation to atherosclerosis. We talked about arteriosclerosis in our peripheral vascular disease, and we talked about with arteriosclerosis, your main problem is that you have formation of plaque in the arterial walls, okay? So when we talked about it with peripheral vascular disease, our problem was in our lower extremities, but you can also have, your patient can also have the same complication, but it affects their coronary arteries. And just to review, the coronary arteries are the arteries that supply oxygen to the heart that allow the heart to function as a pump, as a pump to pump the blood throughout the rest of the body. So if you think about those coronary arteries, if one of those or a few of those have plaque formation inside the arterial wall, then you do not have adequate tissue perfusion. Um, and, and arteriosclerosis is the number one factor in relation to coronary artery disease. Now some of your risk factors that can be modified, the same risk factors that we talked about with peripheral vascular disease, patients who have increased cholesterol, smokers, sedentary lifestyle, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, stress, and excessive alcohol use. And your major important key things that you want to teach your patient is to either stop doing these activities or to increase their activity, um, their physical activity, pay attention to their blood pressure, take their medications, watch their diet, that sort of thing would be important to teach your patient. With coronary artery disease, once one of the vessels becomes either narrowed by the plaque, which this is also can be known as stenosing, or if the um, artery is completely blocked, both problems can cause some ischemia and injury to the, cardio, to the myocardial tissue. What your patient will exhibit, if the problem is stable, your patient may have a stable angina versus unstable angina. And what and as far as their signs and symptoms, with stable angina, your patient will complain of chest pain with exertion that's often caused by exercise and it is familiar with the patient. So the patient may say, um, you know, when I walk up a flight of stairs, I always have some chest pain. Um, and so what you're gonna talk to your patient about doing to help relief with the chest pain is to provide them with nitroglycerin sublingual tablets and then they need to go sit down and rest, okay? Now it's also gonna be important to teach them about nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin is a vasodilator, so it's gonna help open up the vessels to provide more oxygenation to the tissue and if the patient, um, the patient can take up to three tablets in between five to 15 minutes. Um, it's also gonna be really important that you also teach the patient how to check their blood pressure because if their heart rate and their blood, if their blood pressure is less than 100, then they need to reconsider using this medication because it can make their blood pressure a lot worse, okay? With unstable angina, the difference is this patient will have chest pain at rest or they may have chest pain on exertion, um, and it causes them to have activity intolerance. So, you know, whenever they have this pain, either it's gonna happen when they're, you know, not doing anything, it just happens, or, you know, they are doing some activity, and then it causes them to have to stop to do it, stop doing the activity. This can last a little bit longer. Um, than unstable angina and some of your interventions that you would provide your patient is with nitroglycerin beta, beta blockers will help to reduce the patient's heart rate and then you can also have the patient chew aspirin tablets and we want them to chew we can tell the patient they can chew up to four 
to be administered up to a total of 325 milligrams, okay? And the aspirin is gonna help inhibit platelet aggregation and prevent vasoconstriction. So that kind of save us some time before um, this prolongs and becomes a bigger problem. Now, when the arteries are blocked, if, it's, if the blockage is 80 to 90% in the vessels, then this is classified as an MI or a myocardial infarction, okay? So when your patient comes into the hospital, if this happens on your nursing floor, some of the things that may um, patient may report, they're gonna have some sudden intense substernal pain. Um, they may say they feel like something sitting on top of them, on top of their chest. Um, in some women, they may report that it radiates in their left arm, or they may have some jaw pain. The patient may have some nausea and vomiting, fatigue, diaphoresis. They may be short of breath. And then if you may notice, you also may notice that when you put them on the heart monitor, you'll notice some ST elevation. So you'll notice in their cardiac rhythm that from the PQR, S, the T is starting to elevate, okay? And a lot of times you may not be able to see this if you're looking at one lead on your monitor. So you may have to get some, well, you definitely will need to get an EKG to be able to determine if the patient has ST elevation. And then your EKG can also determine where is, which coronary artery is affected. If this were to happen on your nursing floor or in the field, some of the main things that we're gonna do is we immediately need to call EMS, or we're gonna have to call, if we're in the hospital, we're gonna call um, a rapid response. And our main treatment that we're gonna administer before we have to send the patient to ICU is we are gonna do what is called MONA, M-O-N-A. So we're gonna give the patient morphine, provide them with oxygen, nitroglycerin, and give them aspirin to chew. Now, one of the very first things that we can do with these patients, obviously, is we're gonna give them oxygen, and then we're gonna have them to chew the aspirin to prevent, to inhibit platelet aggregation. But what this whole um, scheme of events or scheme of interventions are going to do for you is going to decrease the workload of the heart so that it's not pumping so hard um, and then it's going to help with the O2 supply demand and then stop platelet aggregation so this is going to be like your go-to to buy you some time some additional interventions that you will do are once you've gotten the patient more stable and you've called the um, you've the rapid response team, they've decided this patient has an MI. We are gonna also do um, an EKG so that we can confirm it. Um, we're gonna do some labs, and one of our big labs is gonna be, we're gonna do cardiac enzymes. And the one that we really like to look at is troponin to see if those numbers start to elevate. On the initial um, myocardial infarction, you may not see um, the troponin levels go up but over time, as the tissue starts to um, secrete more enzymes, you'll see that number start to incre increase. So you will check a troponin level um, more, more frequently. And then we're gonna get this patient to ICU. Some of the interventions, depending on you know patient's history, their age, and then how long has this been going on, we may start nitroglycerin um, drip and then we'll have to maintain the patient's um, mean arterial pressure because, because this is a vasodilator, um, it's gonna dramatically drop the patient's blood pressure, so their mean arterial pressure may also drop as well. We are going to consider thrombolytic therapy. So some, it's pretty much like the same medications that we give it in a stroke. If the patient meets criteria, then we will consider using TPA um, or heparin to um, help dislodge the, 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 um, the blockage. And then another intervention may be percutaneous intervention. Um, we may go in and balloon angioplasty the area and help open up the area.
the coronary artery or we may have to just do a full coronary artery bypass graft or we're going to have to take an artery from a different location in the body that is um that is patent and replace it in the coronary artery that's affected Okay, so let's see. Sorry. Next, go ahead and pull out your concept map for hypertension. able to put hypertension in as a prezi this is a newer way to do a concept map but it is very time consuming so I have not had an opportunity to do this with all of my um, with all of my plans okay well, let's get into hypertension Okay, give me a second, I'm having some technical issues. So with hypertension, the patient's systolic would actually be greater than 140, that was a typo, and diastolic greater than 90 without comorbidity. And what comorbidity means is if a patient had a comorbidity, for example, of diabetes, we would want this blood pressure to be more controlled. So we would want our patient's blood pressure to be around 120 to 130 systolic diastolic 70 to 30. So hypertension is classified as a blood pressure of 140 over 90. Excuse the typo. Some of our causes that can cause that is peripheral vascular resistance. And this resistance is increased with increased afterload. So if you have increased resistance that the heart must overcome in order to circulate blood, it can also increase pressure. And sorry, I need to go back. Your other cause to hypertension is cardiac output, or this is a volume issue or preload. Either one or both of these can affect pressure. So either preload or afterload is gonna be your problem with why the patient has hypertension. There's different types of hypertension. Essential hypertension is the most hi common hypertension due to environmental factors, such as increased sodium diet, obesity, smokers, African Americans, high cholesterol, patients that are age 60 and up, stress.
secondary hypertension is hypertension related to a drug or disease process. For example, patients with diabetes can have artery stenosis, which increases re resistance. Kidney disease, pregnancy, oral contraceptives also affects blood pressure and steroids. Malignant hypertension. This is where the patient's blood pressure can get up to systolic greater than 200, diastolic greater than 150, and the patient's having severely increased blood pressure. The patient may complain of nosebleeds. When they wake up in the morning, they may have a headache, blurred vision. Um, if this sustains, it can lead to um, renal failure. Oh, I didn't want to go so quick. It can lead to renal failure or it can also lead to a stroke. Um, this can also lead to a hypertension crisis, which can cause organ failure to the kidneys, brain, and to the heart. So some of your interventions that you want to do for the patient who is in hypertensive crisis is you want to keep their head of the bed up 30 degrees, provide them with some O2 fluids, nasal, uh, normal saline, You'll place them on some beta blockers, and one of the ones we like to use is labetalol. We're gonna check the blood pressure frequently, every five minutes, and then we're gonna check neurovascular status. Now, the signs and symptoms of hypertension is really interesting because there are no signs and symptoms. The signs and symptoms for hypertension is known as the silent killer. Patients don't generally report that they feel bad when their blood pressure is increased. They start feeling symptoms when it has gone on for so long. So you may have a patient, you know, their blood pressure may be increased, but they'll never know until, you know, it starts to really affect them and they start, they seek medical attention and then we check their blood pressure and it's high. Nursing diagnosis for hypertension. Decreased cardiac output. Ineffective tissue perfusion, knowledge deficit, and so now we're going to talk about the interventions that we're going to do to take to um, follow through with our nursing diagnosis. So for decreased cardiac output, some of the interventions that we are going to do is we are going to maintain the patient on a low sodium diet and then medications to restore cardiac output. We'll come back to the medications that you guys reviewed in farm. We're going to monitor the electrolytes. We're going to monitor vital signs and take it in both arm and monitor eyes and nose to assess renal function. And then knowledge deficit. We're going to have to teach the patient lifestyle modifications. Some of the things we're going to have to teach the patient is dietary approaches to stop hypertension. And this is also known as DASH. DASH standing for dietary approaches to stop hypertension. And some of the things that we're going to teach them in relation to DASH is low sodium diet, weight loss, exercising three to four times a week, three to four times a, uh, a week for 40 minutes, decreasing stress, and stopping smoking. So now let's review some of the medications for treatment. Because obviously these patients are gonna be on meds to take care of their hypertension. And so one of the first line of drugs that we usually start out with is diuretics. Um, with the diuretics, one of the key things we'll need to do um, for the patient who's on diuretics is we're going to have to monitor the patient's potassium. Um, the thing is with diuretics, we need to know which, which diuretics, diuretics cause high potassium and which can cause low potassium. So for example, spironolactone is a potassium sparing um, diuretic. It causes potassium retention. So it's going to be really important to teach your patients to eat foods that are low in potassium. Check for weaknesses and palpitations. If the patient is on a loop diuretic, this can cause decreased potassium. 
Um, an example would be furosemide. So you want to teach your patient to report any dizziness. Thiazide diuretics, which include hydrochlorothiazide, can cause decreased potassium as well. And it's going to be important to teach the patient to eat foods high in potassium. And it's also important, as a side note, with diuretics to check your patient for orthostatic hypotension. Okay, so now calcium channel blockers, which would include verapamil and amylodipine. Some of the things we're going to have to do with these patients is teach them to avoid grape juice. They also need to check their blood pressure and heart rate. Call the doctor if their heart rate is less than 60, blood pressure is less than um, systolic less than 100. ACE inhibitors, which are your prills, listening prill and analapril. Again, we're going to have to monitor the potassium because um, it can cause um, hyperkalemia. And then we also need the patient to report a nagging cough. This is a side effect of the medication. Um, and we're gonna DC this drug and put the patient on ARBs. Angiotensin receptive blockers, which include your sartin, so valsartin, low sartin. Um, again, we are our key things that we're going to have to do with these patients on this medication is we need to monitor the potassium. Beta blockers is another drug we can use. It's going to slow the heart rate. In turn, it's going to help decrease blood pressure. Examples are metaprolol and atenolol. Some of your key important nursing interventions would include checking the patient for orthostatic hypotension and then checking heart rate. Um, if the patient is heart rate is less than 60, then we may need to uh, we'll need to talk to the doctor about holding the medication. Okay, so this was what your final concept map should look like. Um, again, make sure you review over the medications, your nursing interventions, and the different types of, of hypertension. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me via email. All right, we have one more subject to go over. And give me a second to upload. Go ahead and pull out your congestive heart failure concept map. Um, okay, I don't like how that looks, but we got to roll with it. Okay, with congestive heart failure, and I'm start. I'm a cursor over where I'm talking so that if you want to make additional notes. Um, you can as you as you may um, with heart failure the pathophysiology is the heart or the heart is a pump and with heart failure the pump fails and so over time with the failure of the pump it causes the, the muscle to enlarge as a result of failure to comp compensate for not being able to send out blood properly but due to this compensation, it causes the heart to have decreased cardiac output, which also makes it more, the heart make more, um, contract more forcefully. And then um, 
because the contractions are more forceful and causes the patient's heart rate to increase, okay? Now, because the heart is failing, some of the things that happens is volume is not pumped properly and the tissue in other organs does not get adequate supply, okay? So when you're thinking about a patient with heart failure, you should automatically think patients who have problems with fluid volume or they may have some tissue hypoxia. Now there's different types of heart failure. Your book goes into a little bit more detail, but I'm gonna break it down into right-sided heart failure and left-sided heart failure. We'll start with the right side. With right-sided heart failure, your problem is you have fluid that gets backed up into the right side of the heart. And so this right ventricle is where the blood is supposed to pump through the right ventricle to the pulmonic, um, to the pulmonic artery, okay? And then from here, it goes into the lungs. Well, if you have heart failure, this ventricle has difficulty with pumping the blood to the lungs. And so you get a backup of fluid in the right atrium, and then you get a backup of fluid in the super vena cava, inferior vena cava. And so what you see in these patients is they have systemic congestion. So their backup of fluid is usually somewhere in the body, okay? So what you're gonna see in these patients is you're gonna see some jugular vein distension. And that's where you're gonna see those bulging neck veins. These patients may have hepatomegaly or sp splenomegaly where the spleen and the liver have enlarged because of the fluid. You'll notice their, their peripheral edema. So their feet are gonna be, um, are gonna have some swelling. You'll notice in their abdomen, they may have some ascites. And then you may notice that this patient is gaining weight and their weight is due to fluid. Some of your causes for right ventricular failure would include preload issues. So again, preload is volume. Patients with COPD. Think about COPD. We've learned about COPD in the past. So if you have a patient who is having some difficulty with gas exchange and then it has the patient has trouble with breathing, it puts more pressure on the vessels that is trying to send blood to the lungs, everything gets backed up from the lungs to this artery to the right ventricles and then so forth. This is also known as core pulmonale. Patients with pulmonary hypertension, so their vessels in their lungs have more resistance, and so blood is not getting to the lungs properly because the, there's so much resistance here, so then you get a backup. Coronary artery disease, which you'll see this in patients who have had a heart attack on the right side of their heart, and the heart's not getting adequate oxygen, so then that heart, that heart, that side of the heart can start to fail and then left heart failure which we haven't even talked about but left heart failure can also cause right-sided heart failure now I'll come back to this here in a second left-sided heart failure so if you think about how blood travels throughout the body goes from the right right atrium right ventricle to the lungs then from the lungs, it goes to the left atrium, left ventricle, to the aorta, to the rest of the body. Well, with left-sided ventricular failure, your problem is the left ventricle is not able to pump the blood to the aorta, to the, to the rest of the body. So then you get a backup here that backs up in the left atrium, that backs up into the patient's lung. A good way to help you to remember left-sided heart failure is left equals lung. So a lot of your problems are gonna be pulmonary issues. Because the blood is backed up and not able to go into the circulatory system, 
this patient will have decreased cardiac output because they're not putting out enough blood to the rest of the body. So what you're going to see in this patient, they're going to be fatigued, they're going to be weak, they may have some chest pain, confusion because blood is not getting to the brain properly, their heart rate may increase as a, as a mechanism to try to fix, fix it. You'll notice that their pulses are weak, specifically their peripheral pulses. They may have cool extremities, shortness of breath, crackles, wheezing. One of the classic symptoms that the patient can have, which means that now your lungs are starting to get irritated by the resistance, is that the patient may have pink frothy sputum. So that's like the vessels starting to bleed and now when they cough, they're coughing up bloody sputum. And then you may hear S3 and S4, which is extra beats on your heart, heart sounds. Our calls for left ventricular function, afterload, so this is the resistance, hypertension, coronary artery disease, and pulmonary congestion. What this leads to when the patient has either right or left-sided ventricular failure it leads to tissue hypoxia because the tissue is not able to have adequate ox oxygenation because the heart's not pumping properly. And then it also causes fluid volume excess. So these patients are hypervolemic. Now let me go back up to here. These are your diagnostic exams. So some of the exams that the doc may do to diagnose this patient, they may use a physical exam and with the physical exam, the, patient, the doc may go off the patient's report to actually what's happening. Um, to confirm it, they're gonna use a lab test of the beta natriuretic peptide and see if it's greater than 100. They can look at a chest x-ray to look for the enlarged muscle. Or the most classic uh, diagnostic test is an echocardiogram. And what most hospitals will look at the ejection fraction and if it's less than 40%, then the patient is, has symptoms of, of heart failure. Now how we're gonna take care of our patient, our nursing diagnosis, and I'm gonna go down each of them and talk about what we're gonna do. So one of our problems with this patient that we need to, um, our goal is that we need to improve cardiac output. And the cardiac output is not improved because of the pump failure. So some of the things that we can do um, to help with improving cardiac output is by providing medication for these patients. So ACE inhibitors and ARBs help with um, afterload. Diuretics is gonna help with preload, decreasing preload. Your nitrates helps with preload and afterload because it's a vasodilator. Inotropes can be used as to help with contractility, so making that muscle a lot more stronger. Beta blockers, morphine can help with decrease and decrease preload and afterload. And then some other interventions that we're going to do that can improve cardiac output. These patients are going to be on a low so sodium diet, so that's like a two gram diet, and if and really even lower than that. So no salt at all almost. Fluid restrictions, which the doctor will give specific totals. Um, and then we're gonna be checking this patient's daily weight um, because we know if the patient gains weight, one kilogram equals to a liter of fluid. Um, and that could tell us that their symptoms are worsening, are starting to worsen. Another way we can tell about weight gain is we can measure the patient's abdominal girth. Our next intervention that we need to maintain is to prevent, manage pulmonary edema. Because these patients have fluid volume excess, they're at risk for edema in the lungs. And this is as evidenced by crackles in the lower lobe. The patient can have pink frothy sputum, tachycardia, or they may be restless. This is an action in critical alert in your book. There's several. So some of the things that we're gonna do for the patient to either prevent or manage pulmonary edema, we're gonna keep them in high fowlers to help them with breathing. We want this patient in um, on high flow O2. So we may have to use a non-rebreather because we want them at 
Um, our goal is to keep their O2 sets um, elevated. We need to auscultate and listen to the patient's lung sounds. And it's going to be important to document the lung sounds, especially if you hear crackles in the bases and then those crackles start to move up to another location. So say you listen to crackles and they're in the bases and then you check on your patient two hours later and your crackles is in your middle lobe or your upper lobe, that basically means your lung is filling up with fluid and that we need to intervene immediately before the patient drowns. In their own in their own body in their own body um, fluids. Some things that we can do to manage nitro nitroglycerin if the patient's blood pressure is greater than a hundred. We can use diuretics, Bumax or Bumethotane is a really good drug to use, and morphine may also be a consideration. Some other things that kind of go with preventing management but it also goes more with decreasing fatigue is we may have to use some interdisciplinary care so we're going to need the respiratory therapist um, to help us to manage the patient with pulmonary edema we're going to allow the patient to rest and also with allowing the patient to rest we may also need to um, assess the patient's response to activity and consult a physical therapist to help us. So these patients will need interdisciplinary to take care of them. The last nursing diagnosis is that these patients, there's a lot of information we gotta teach them because the thing about heart failure, the patient can have acute exacerbations, but this is a chronic disease. So we need to teach our patient as much as possible so that they're not coming back into the hospital with reoccurrences. This is also a core measure. So it's again, one of those disease processes that we have to do really good documentation and make sure we do a lot of education because there's a lot of care that we have to take with these patients. So we are gonna tell our patient when they're time, to, time for them to go home or throughout their um, stay at our hospital they need to report the following symptoms. If they have a weight gain that is three pounds in a week or um, one to two pounds overnight, they need to call the doctor. If they notice they're having decreased activity and tolerance for greater than two days, if they develop a cold or cold symptoms and it's been going on for three days, they have polyuria at night, shortness of breath, chest pain, they notice swelling and then we need to teach these patients that they need to maintain a low sodium diet watch their fluid intake and that they need to take their medications and generally if the patient doesn't have any other health problems that will affect them these patients will be sent on aces and arbs they may be sent home with a diuretic or beta blocker um, it just depends on what's going to work for these patients. But generally, I will see patients sent home with the ACE and at least the ACE or ARB. Okay, so this completes. I'll have one more thing. Another way to help you to remember how to treat a patient with congestive heart failure is the acronym UNLOAD fast. So what each letter stands for, U, upright position, N, nitrates, so your nitroglycerin, L, Lasix, O, oxygen, A, ACE inhibitors, D, digoxin, F, fluids, decreased, afterload, A, afterload, decreased, S, sodium restriction, T for test. And the test that we wanna know about is um, the BMP levels. Um, if the patient's taking the joxin, we need to know that level. Um, we also need to know the potassium level, and then we also need to know the patient's ABGs. Okay, so this completes the lecture. I'll go back and let you look at these, see if you missed anything. Um, you may listen to this over and over. And again, if you have any questions, please contact me um, for reinforcement. Thank you, and you all have a good night.